दिस इज भारत एफ एम बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत ये है भारत एफएम बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत नमस्कार सत्याकाल वेलकम एंड आदा यू आर लिस्निंग टू भारत एफएम और वन ऑफ इट्स काइंड मल्टीलिंगुअल इक्लेक्टिक प्रोवाइडर ऑफ एंटरटेनमेंट इंफॉर्मेशन एंड न्यूज टू इंडियन अमेरिकन्स headquartered in Cincinnati Ohio Bharat FM airs shows out of Cincinnati Chicago and Phoenix we take pleasure in our ability to cater to your bhakti chusti sphurti shakti and masti needs with our audio and visual shows check out bharatfm.com for our online program schedule and archives i'm sure the content will definitely tickle your senses tune in via the 24 hour web streaming on bharatfm.com or via the Bharat FM app more information can be procured at 5134885070 Hello good evening good morning welcome to storytellers cafe and i am your host usha venkatraman from mumbai how are you doing my friends i hope you are uh, taking care of all the rules of this lockdown masked washing your hands and maintaining social distancing and of course like i said last time those strawberry moments that you experience on storytellers cafe you don't want to miss it right so sit back cozy yourself with your family members and listen to stories on storytellers cafe i have a surprise guest i'm not going to introduce her now but i just want to give you a little trivia about singapore you know singapore the name the english name comes from the malay name singapura which is believed to have been derived from the sanskrit meaning lion city singa means lion and which comes from the sanskrit word simha and then pura means city in sanskrit so it is a common suffix in many indian place names singapore is a wealthy southeast asian nation once a british colony a trading post like india today it is a thriving financial global hub and described as one of asia's economic tigers so i know you guessed but hold your breath we will introduce our guest a little later namaskar main aapke liye bahut sundar kahani lai hu a long long time ago when the earth was still new all the animals lived in harmony creator was very pleased with her creation and what a creation it was warm beaches glorious sunsets snow capped mountains she was very very pleased she so she spent her time enjoying her lovely creation and like any other artist it was very difficult to be satisfied so she put finishing touches sometimes she'd be putting a little pink into a sunset sometimes she'd be changing a butterfly's wing another time she was teaching a spider how to sew and make its web when tailor bird came to creator and told her oh creator can you help me find a place to stay Hmm, thought creator, and brought out her sewing kit and began to teach Taylor Bird how to sew and make a lovely little nest for himself. 
as he did that, creator was finishing it all up and was almost done. When suddenly, ah, uh, where's my pin cushion? I put it here, I know. <gasps> and there it was. It looked up at her now, a tiny ball of pins with tiny, teeny, beady black eyes, a sharp, pointy nose, and little feet. She had been so engrossed that she had brought her pincushion to life. Oh, you're so cute, she said. And she smoothed the pins back from her now alive pincushion. Hmm, I think I will call you poker pin. And yes, I think you could be a little bigger so that, you know, no one really steps on you. Yeah, those pins are sharp. And poof, off, off you go, darling, poker pin. And so soon there were a lot of poker pins walking around the entire world. And all was well. Or was it? There was just one thing. I forgot to mention it. All the animals, although they loved Creator, and Creator loved them so much, they did not quite like each other so much. Um, take the example of deer and lion. Now, lion was extraordinarily fond of deer. Are, Mary John. But dear, just could not stand lion and ran away every time he came close. Can you blame him? Who could like someone that only wanted to eat you up all the time? Well, it was all very harmonious because even if lion couldn't, you know, if even if deer couldn't eat lion, at least I could run away and lion went hungry sometimes, which pleased deer no end. The poker pins, meanwhile, when they came into this beautiful, lovely space, tried to make friends. But every time a poker pin passed by, ow, ooh, ee, their sharp quills and pins hurt everyone. And so no one wants to be with, wanted to be friends with them. They were quite unhappy. And soon the animals even started singing nasty songs. Poke, poke, poke you pin, we don't like you. You're pokey and you hurt us and you smell like poo. Oh, oh sorry, polite company, smell like a shoe. They weren't shoes that time, but whatever. Finally, the poker pins gave up. They were so sad and unhappy that they decided that they would go and live in a little cave. Well, it wasn't that little. It was in a small island on a large hill, very close to the mainland. And there, uh, the cave was big enough to handle and, you know, to take them and keep them in safety and comfort. And so the Pokopins decided that they would go and live there. The animals were very delighted and they began sing singing again. Poke, poke, Pocupine, we're glad you're going away. You're prickly and you're pointy. We don't want you anyway. Well, the porcupines, as they now were called, went to this little cave and settled quite comfortably. The island had some fruit trees and it was very peaceful. And all was well. Mm until there came a huge storm on the mainland. All the trees were uprooted. There was thunder, there was lightning. The animals knew that definitely after this, there would be hail and then snow. They were sure to freeze. They didn't know what to do and they knew that it was their last day on this beautiful land that Creator had created for them. Until someone remembered the porcupines 
and their cave. Let's go ask them. Maybe they'll let us in. We haven't been kind to them. Why should they do it? To wit to woo. We have no choice, said Owl. We have to ask them or freeze to death. And so the animals went all the way to the porcupine cave and asked the porcupines if they would shelter them. The porcupines were very surprised, but of course they let them in. They shared their fruit with them and the animals all huddled warm and safe in that cave. As they were so close to each other and is the nature of sharp and pointy things, some of them did get pricked and poked. Ow! Eek! Oop! Especially in the middle of the night when everybody fell asleep. Oh, we are so sorry, said the porcupines. But this time, no one seemed to mind. It is better to stay warm and safe here than to freeze outside in the cold said the animals and all is well the storm passed and the day dawned bright and clear the animals began to make their way back to the mainland but they turned to the porcupines come with us porcupines we are sorry we didn't mean to hurt you it was a mistake. We did not see your lovely, tender, gentle hearts. We only saw your pins and quills. The porcupines replied, But you'll still get poked every time we walk by. Yes, but now we know that you do not mean it. And it is better to bear a few pricks and pokes and live with you, our family, than to leave you here alone. And they began to sing again. Poke, 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 you pines, we're sorry we hurt you. You're kind and sweet and gentle. Come live with us, do. And so the porcupines relented and came to live on the mainland. And all finally was truly well. Bravo, bravo. What a lovely, inclusive story, Preeti. I know my audience is waiting to know you, to get introduced to you. So as you all guessed, my friends, Preeti Modi Ayer is from the island nation of Singapore. Namaskaram, Singapore. Hello, Singapore. And Salamat Pagi, right? In <laughs> Malaysia. I hope I got that right. Okay. Now, Preeti Modi Ayer, as you know, is a wonderful storyteller. What a lovely narrative. What a beautiful story that was. She is also an empowerment coach and a leadership trainer. Preeti is an enthusiastic, engaging storyteller and finds that stories are a powerful medium to inspire change. I completely agree. She tells stories in libraries, schools and for storytelling festivals, both online and in person. Preeti extensively uses stories in her corporate workshops, keynotes. Preeti draws on her experience and repertoire to connect to her audience and to ensure her storytelling performances are entrancing and memorable. I don't doubt it at all. You know, Preeti is a doctor. She's a naturopath, a certified <laughs> firework instructor, empowerment coach, certified in training and development, and has a bunch of traditional letters, <laughs> management, accounting. And sometimes she uses this to beef up her bio. I love that beefing up. You know, we all need that. So welcome, to, uh, Preeti, to Storytellers Cafe. A pleasure, a pleasure to 
host you. I know you're a wonderful storyteller. I can't forget the Pachak story <laughs> that, uh, told in the story swap in Singapore. And welcome to Storytellers Cafe, a pleasure. And I loved your story. So tell us a bit about the story about the porcupine that you narrated. Okay, so this story is something that I have written. Uh, I wrote it last year, right in the middle of all of the craziness that is happening outside in our world. When we were all sheltering from that storm, we still are, right? Uh, it hasn't passed for everyone. And uh, at that time, when I wrote it, I, I imagined that it would be gone soon and we would all be back together instead of people separately living on little, little islands alone. Um, and today now I see that it's become even more relevant because honestly, it doesn't matter what the pricks and pokes are with each other as a family, as nations, you could extend this to all, all society, you can keep it in your family unit because with all with the online work, online schooling, everybody is screaming and shouting, jostling for space or whether it is a big country that is, you know, just attempting to protect its people or even a city, you can you can extend the story everywhere. The only way we're going to get through it is together. So I wrote it with, with that intention and uh, I've never told it anywhere else. So this is this, a special day because when Usha ji asked me uh, that you know she wanted me to do this for her uh, and we've known each other for a little while, not very long, but uh, she's been telling me that, Preeti, I want you to do something nice for Mumbai Storytellers and for Bharat FM. Uh, so I was like, okay, what can I give special that I have not done before? So I, this, this was the idea. Thank you, Preeti. Yes, uh, you know, my name has become synonymous with Mumbai Storytellers Society as uh, I'm a founder member of that along with uh, some wonderful founders, co-founders. Uh, Preeti will definitely have you for a workshop at Mumbai Storytellers Society. But uh, Bharat FM is indeed very happy to host you. And this uh, story that you've written and this is, you've done it during the pandemic, right? That's what you yes. said. Yes. That's Beautiful. Right. Last June. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. And you've used this island since you live in Singapore. Um, yes. Can you tell us about, you have a string of degrees. You know, you're a doctor, you're an MBA, you're a certified coach. You have studied in the United States. And what is a person with letters doing with stories? Why are you taking away our job? <laughs> that is so sweet of you. I could never take away the storyteller's job because the more storytellers there are, the nicer the world is. Okay, so uh, where do I begin? Um, let's start at the beginning. So when I started off with my career, um, I, I started off traditionally. I started working with CNBC TV 18 and I was doing financial analysis and financial uh, reporting for them for some time. Um, I moved into marketing, sales, and then moved into HR where I worked in the US for almost five years. And at that time, I got into a, a company called Relaxity. And there we did relaxation and stress management workshops. So one of my first clients was Microsoft. And it was, a, it was an experience because for a young, you know, fairly new person to be training all of these wonderful people at, uh, and, and all the large companies. Um, so I really began to enjoy it. I had been doing training and leadership workshops since college. I was assisting um, coaches and teachers from then. But I, this, this was like the first time when I had begun running my own workshops. This was around 2001 about. So that's when I started. And, uh, and then, I, then I realized that people appreciate the exercises and the lectures and the theory and the science behind everything. But when you tell them a story, they remember it. And this was, was reiterated when I came, moved back to India, got married and started touring India with some, for some of my clients, some sales, retails clients, doing workshops for them. 
So sometimes we had uh, people whom we were training at uh, at lower sales levels. Sometimes we had partners and uh, CEOs and MDs, and all of them. The only thing common. Sometimes they would even be be in the same room together. Uh, and obviously, the theory, the the partner, the manager, the MD would know, but the story was something that they could all connect with. They could all take with them and use to uh, change. So any any story became like a metaphor. So you, I started using more metaphors. I started using more stories. So I, my theory would be a little bit, a little bit of the presentation, because nobody would remember the slides and the graphs, but they would remember. So if I wanted to teach Maslow's need hierarchy theory, uh, uh, theory, I would talk about Amitabh Bachchan. I would tell them his life story, how he started with nothing and how he was hungry and wanted roti kapra makan. And then he would go higher and higher and who he is now. So people began to really understand and connect and associate my workshops as being more entertaining and interesting and memorable. And it wasn't because of anything I did. It was the stories. Uh, and then I became a mother. That was it. Story, <laughs> you need a story for everything. Khana khao, story, brush karo, story, you know, school jao, story. And uh, it just went on. When I moved to Singapore, uh, I discovered that uh, despite all the long string of degrees that I had, uh, working here was difficult. And any, anybody who has lived abroad will tell you. In the beginning, sometimes getting a job, doing this, doing that is not easy because of visa requirements, dependents, this, that. So because I was in a dependent past, I couldn't really work work. So I started volunteering. And when I began volunteering, I discovered the, the world of professional storytelling. Singapore has a marvelous uh, storytelling community, which is now growing and strengthening in India. The US has it as well. It's a marvelous community. Uh, and in my journey, I found lovely people. Um, I'm now a member of uh, an executive committee member of the Singapore Storytelling, Associ Storytelling Association Singapore and of FEAST, which is the Federation of Asian Storytellers. And I, I began to participate in storytelling festivals and do workshops in storytelling festivals, both online as well as in Singapore and abroad, um, telling stories, doing workshops, teaching, bringing more and more of my work in both both the uh, uh, worlds began to meld, blend, and collide. So now I don't even know where one begins and the other ends. Uh, that's how it began for me, and uh, that's where I am today. Thank you, thank you, uh, Preeti, for uh, you know, kind of chartering your uh, trajectory into the world of storytelling. Yes, our life is made up of stories. So, uh, you know, you don't know where it begins and where it ends. And if, you, uh, if you're lucky enough to become a professional storyteller, then God bless you. You know, that's the best thing that could happen to you. Uh, Preeti, as I was going through your profile, I saw that you are into business storytelling. You're a business coach. Now, the very few uh, business uh, workshops, corporate workshops that I've done is I use uh, in business storytelling, I use the hybrid story, you know, the metaphor. So, uh, for example, I follow this uh, wonderful guy, uh, Doug Stevenson, and who says that, uh, you know, when you want to give medicine to your dog, you <laughs> put the a pill in the peanut butter. You know, that is the story. You put the pill inside the peanut butter, coat it and then give. Similarly, when you want to make a pitch, when you want to talk to uh, your corporate employees, when the management wants to uh, tell them something, sometimes it's hard to swallow facts. You know, so uh, then this hybrid storytelling becomes a very, very powerful tool. So uh, can you tell us about what kind of tool that you use in your corporate coaching sessions as well as storytelling. That will be interesting for our viewers. 
Sure, I'd be glad to. So, uh, so the when I do business storytelling, I do it in two ways. So I have clients that come to me and ask me to help them craft their personal narrative. Because as you know, a company after a little while takes a life of its own. It needs to. And I'm not talking only about brand building because, uh, you know, the advertising world has been doing it forever. The image of the brand, what to say, what to think, what to color, what to look like, all of that is fine. What I'm talking about is who is behind that image? Who is the person? So we're taught that, you know, a company becomes alive, almost takes a life of its own. And it's supposed to because you're supposed to take care of succession planning and, you know, perpetuity and who will manage. A lone CEO can very rarely go very high. You need people to uh, to take on. So so that is one set of my clients learning how to uh, to craft the company's narrative, how like how I showed you my trajectory. And and I'm sure I'm not sure if that made any sense, but you may have been able to connect to me and get to know me better. So a client will know you better because you have a story behind you, something real. OK, so that is one set of of things that I use. And that is crafted very much like a personal story, how we would craft. There's a thing you you have taken something that has happened, you have processed it, you have used it, and then now you're describing it or sharing it. Uh, say, for example, in the beginning of the company, say, if, uh, you know, you say you lost a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, this, this usually happens. I've had few entrepreneurs and, and uh, people getting to the next level that come to me for this. That's why I'm talking about. So in the beginning, they lost a lot of money and had to close down a division. So so that sorrow or that thing, not only did it become a learning session, but it also became a, a traject, a bounce point to help them to grow. So that would be included in the narrative, in the story, as the successes and milestones as well. So the traditional narrative is like, OK, I started from zero and overnight I became a success. No, with with this sort of thing, it, you are creating the persona and and showing people the hard work that went behind your product, your brand, because we want that. We want to see. We don't want to see. We don't think, OK, everybody on from uh, from heaven and given this skill and magic we want to see that so we aspire to it so customers and clients will relate to you better because they know that you have done the groundwork to build that success a tree doesn't grow in a day so they know that this mighty tree in front of me is not you know something that doesn't exist if you're a startup so i've had startups come to me so they don't have a backstory. What do they do? So their story is their idea, their vision, their dream. What are they thinking about? The stories of the founders combined and the struggles they go through every night. What do they think? I mean, we love to hear about all the startups that opened in garages and how it, they did and, you know, how many people closed the door, all the drama. We, we all, oh, my goodness, they did it and we managed and we can do it too. So we find all of that inspiring. So that is one aspect. The second aspect comes within a workshop when you're teaching. So then you are talking about either a sales uh, so sales pitch in which, again, you're giving a clarity to a brand, to your product, or within a workshop, you're building a narrative. You're explaining a product, a project or an idea or a theory or a graph through a story. So. Thank you, Preeti. I can see the passion. You know, it's palatable. <laughs> it's coming over the airwaves. <laughs> Wonderful and so very well explained. Thank you for that. You know, we've had a few. Uh, uh, of course, I'm sure uh, all the storytellers have had uh, experience in business storytelling. But we had uh, Amin, uh, you know, who explained, uh, uh, you know, he's more into business storytelling. So um, Amin Huck is from Bangalore. He was one of my guests on Storytellers Cafe. So uh, it's really nice uh, to understand this aspect of it. So Preeti, the USP of Storytellers Cafe is stories. And <laughs> like, I was, like I was talking to you that uh, Bharat FM has uh, launched Bharat TV, which you can see on the screen. And Bharat TV uh, has uh, also launched OTT platform. And Storytellers Cafe is on the OTT platform. So um, 
we are uh, we kind of just kind of uh, launched the first season and we are planning the second season of storytellers cafe and of course third season and so on and um, the viewers the listeners want to listen to stories <laughs> you know, that's been my feedback um you know uh, but though i love to talk to my guests less of conversations expressions maybe in between but they want stories so do you have something for us of course i do there's nothing i like better than telling stories uh, i mean other than than cuddling with my kids but then now that's not a competition right because i can do both <laughs> together <laughs> absolutely can you tell us a little bit about the story that you're uh, doing and uh, i just want you to before you start this uh, your story did you undergo any training formal training in storytelling so uh, i have not so i have not undergone any professional or formal training that said i will say this because uh, we have some love marvelous people in singapore who are constantly working with you and teaching you as you go forward so uh, i've learned from you as well usha i remember once talking with you and watching one of your performances no it's true because each each storyteller has their own style and their own magic if you call it right so although i admire it there's no one i can i can be i can't be like all of these marvelous people so i i i'm just so excited and happy with my stories i sometimes feel like i'm 5 years old you know when i'm telling a story or hearing or listening to one so i'm i'm it, that that to me is is the joy and um i like to think that i'm reasonably good at it but i know that there is a lot to do and to move and to grow and there is so much of the craft that i could develop so uh, so i do not have any formal training that is one letter a b c d something i don't have sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's fine you are a wonderful storyteller you know very few uh, tellers impress me and uh, i was I've, i've been telling you i was drawn to you after that story in the story swap and uh, i like your confidence uh, your uh, because that's very very it it doesn't come easily it comes with years of experience but uh, <laughs> being in the corporate world and coaching you know and that came across and beautiful so i won't keep away you and the listeners from your lovely story so go ahead please okay so what i'll do if you don't mind usha is i would like to tell the story first and then we'll talk if you want for 2 minutes or 1 minute about it so uh, because it will be more fun then so i'll just Absolutely. do it first okay Absolutely. okay so let's go ha this is a way let's go andhera nagari chopat raja takisare bhaji takisare khaja कितनी बार सुना है आपने वी हर्ट दिस सो मेनी 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 टाइम्स बट डू यू नो वेर इट कम्स फ्रॉम लेट मी ट्रांसलेट फॉर दोज ऑफ यू हु हैव नॉट हर्ट दिस बिफोर ये हिंदी मुहावरा और हिंदी प्रॉवर्ब इज अ वेरी फेमस एंड पावरफुल वन एंड वेन वी ट्रांसलेटेड इट इट साउंड लाइक दिस डार्क इज द किंगडम foolish insane is the king one coin for a vegetable one coin for anything a taka was a unit was a coin a silver coin that of course 1966 or 1947 changed into uh, the currency as we know today and a sale is a unit of measurement like a liter approximate exactly 1 liter or if you were to translate it 1 kilo a long long time ago there lived a king in india the only thing was he was extremely foolish and he had a minister that was equally foolish now you know how people are how they just want to be unique for no reason at all just do something kuch bhi alag karna hai eh bhai well this guy was like that and he decided one day hmm how do i 
create something different and unique in my kingdom. And he decided that night would be day and day would be night. At first, the people resisted, but this king was very sharp. He made sure that nothing could happen because he would catch them and execute them. The people were so frightened and so scared that they began to follow his rules. And they began to sleep as soon as the sun rose and wake up as soon as it set. Now, and all was well, <laughs> or was it? <laughs> well, one day, a guru and his disciple made their way and found their way into the city. And when they reached there, they were very surprised. Are, itna sundar shahar? Wah, wah, kya sadke hai? Lekin yaha koi hai kyo nahi? Where is everyone? And suddenly, they remembered, maybe this is that city we had heard of. Hmm, okay. And then, suddenly, when the sun set, everyone awoke and it was a bustling town. In the daytime, they had not even seen cats, dogs or cows because these people had trained their animals to sleep in the day. And now it was just a city like any other. They were hungry, the guru and his disciple. And so they went to a shopkeeper and asked him, Are bhai, ye kaisa diya? Ek ser, ek taka. Bas, it was an expensive fruit. Okay, de do, de do. And they went on ahead. Are bhai, ye kaisa diya? Ek ser, ek taka. It was a liter of milk. Or wo? They were dates or khaja, which was very expensive in India because they had to come from the deserts of Arabia. Ek ser ek taka. <gasps> it was too much for the disciple. He began to spend all his money and began to gather all the food that he possibly could carry. And the guru just watched him. The disciple picked up the vegetables he likes, he picked up ghee, he picked up butter, he picked up milk, he picked up dates and almonds and all the delicious things he could and took them to where they were staying on the outskirts of the city. And when they say that he had cooked, he had made a meal and cooked, the disciple said, ah, ha, 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 itne dino ke baad santusht hua hume. I have not eaten for so many months, Guruji. Finally, I'm happy today. The Guru smiled and said, That is okay. Ye to theek hai. Lekin aap ab hum chalna chahiye hume. Yahan rehna mat. But the disciple would not agree. Nahi, Guruji. Thodi de, thode din mujhe yahan rehne do. Let me stay here, please. Because I have not eaten and you know how much I love food. Guruji, I have not yet attained a sadhuhood like you. I am not yet there. Allow me this one indulgence. And so the Guru said, all right, I will go. And after three months, I will come back and fetch you. Enjoy yourself till then. And so the disciple was very happy. Every night he would wake up and go and buy the choicest of fruits and vegetables. His favorite was, of course, the khaja or the dates, which were high in sugar and extremely fatty. <laughs> and very soon, feasting on ghee and dates and milk, he became nice and round. And all was well. <laughs> Not really. One day, what happened was a thief broke into a cloth merchant's house. And as he had made that big hole and he went in, on his way out, the wall fell on him and he died on the spot. 
his brother who was waiting outside for the loot was very upset. And taking his dead body, he went to the king and told the king, Your Majesty, my brother was taking care of his ancient work, his ancient trade. And he has been murdered by that wall of that rich merchant. That cloth merchant, he has so much money, he could not have made a good wall. He has murdered my brother. He must be punished and compensation given to me. Mm. The king agreed with his logic and called the cloth merchant. Hazur, tell me, no, no, this is not my fault. I have not done anything. How can I? No. No, you have murdered this man. You should have made a good wall for your house. How dare you? You will be punished. And then the man begging and pleading for his life said, Azur, it could not have been me. It has to be the bricklayer. The bricklayer who made this wall. He made it in my father's time. He must not have done a good job. I know nothing about walls. My father must have trusted him. Hmm. Call the bricklayer. And so they called him. The bricklayer came, all doddering. Yes, Azur, I know. I am sorry. Yes. It was me that made that wall. Then you will be punished. How dare you make such a bad wall? A poor innocent man has lost his life today because of your wall. No, 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 your majesty. It is not my fault. It is not my fault at all that I mistreated and made such a terrible wall. I don't think he meant to rhyme, but it's okay. In his, when people are stressed, they do a lot of things. As he sat there pleading for his life, he remembered something. And he said to the king, your majesty, I know now why that wall was so bad. The wall is bad because when I was a young man and I was making it, I was in love with a dancer. And she would not even give me the time of the day. And that day, she was walking up and down and up and down, going chum, chum, chum with her with her anklets and I got distracted. I must have mixed too much water. That is why the wall fell. Poor man, thought the king. He must have got distracted. Call that dancer. And so that dancer was called. The dancer came, an old woman, but still very graceful and beautiful. Your majesty, how can I help you? You need not help me. You are to be punished because you have distracted the bricklayer while he was building the wall, which has now fallen on that poor thief in that merchant's house. Oh, um, your majesty, it is not my fault that I did that. I did not mean to distract him. I knew he was looking at me, but I didn't really think he would look at me so long. I was just going to the goldsmith, to the sonar. My necklace was with him. And I called him every day. I had to walk up and down and up and down just because he would not give it to me. You must catch him, Your Majesty. He is the scoundrel. Hmm. That must be right, this poor innocent woman. The case deepens. It is not easy to, dis to find out and find the truth in a case like this. Call that sunar. The goldsmith could be found nowhere. And then they found him in the corner of his shop, hiding right down in the cellar. They called him in, bound him hand and foot and brought him in. You! You are the one. Why did you trouble this poor woman so many years ago? You should have given her her necklace. Then she, then she would not have walked up and down with her anklets going chum, chum, chum. And the bricklayer would not have been distracted. And the wall would have been built well. And today it would not have fallen on this poor man. 
your majesty i am um, um i wanted to look at the lady that is true she was a very beautiful dancer but the truth the real reason why i called her was because i had a very big wedding order it had come from a rich cloth merchant in the fam- in the city and he had not and he had given me the order and he was so impatient he would not wait i told him so much that i will make this one necklace for this lady but he would not agree and he would not wait so i had to do his order first and so she had to come up and down many times you must catch that cloth merchant it is his fault that i was not able to do my job hmm find that cloth merchant now and what do you know happened the cloth merchant was none other than the the young cloth merchant's father but he had been long gone he had passed away many years ago so this time the cloth merchant was brought back before the king your majesty it is not my fault it is my father's fault what did i do pita ke avgun pete bharega and then he said it is your duty now to pay the sins of your father you will pay for his sins because you have inherited his wealth and good deeds as well you will be punished i knew it you were the scoundrel when i saw you ha minister this is the end of this discussion we shall hang this man and it has taken us over a month to come to this conclusion so now what we will do is we will build a new scaffold and a new place to hang get the best weavers and the best and the strongest rope and so it was ordered and we will have a large celebration to celebrate the hanging of this scoundrel and so the celebration preparations began a beautiful huge ornamental scaffold was built and rope was bit, was made strong wonderful and large meanwhile that merchant took almost a month or more to for all of this to happen that merchant in the jail didn't know what to do he stopped eating he stopped drinking he stopped everything and he became as thin as a rake when he was brought before the king just before being hung they tried that noose on him and instead of sitting anywhere near his shoulders it went plop down to the floor <gasps> oh my god this noose will not fit him and now there's no time to make a new one the minister was very confused what do we do my lord what what can we do hmm the minister said you tell me minister you must have a solution you are wise your majesty let's find a man who will fit the noose that way the noose is also not wasted and the scaffold is also used that is a good suggestion all right soldiers go find me a man who will fit the noose and so the soldiers took that big noose and began trying it on random people in the street most of the people were too thin because you know you're not getting enough vitamin d if you're awake at night and not sleeping in the day but they were thin and weak and the noose slipped all the way down to their feet until you know exactly who they found you're right it was the disciple who had fattened himself up with all the rich food and he used to wake up in the day so he had enough vitamin d and the noose now fit well on his plump shoulders around his neck aha there you are come on now it is your turn we shall take you to the king and so he was bound and taken to the king 
Your Majesty, Your Majesty, I have not done anything. I am a sadhu or a sadhu in training, almost a sadhu. I, I have not done anything. All my only problem is that I have eaten too much. I am only guilty of gluttony. Never one bad thought in my life I have had. Forgive me, please, Your Majesty. I will run away. I will never darken your doorstep. I, 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 I. The king did not listen to him. We need a man that will fit the noose and you will fit. The disciple prayed, ranted, raved, did everything, but nothing worked. Luckily for him, the next day when he was going to be hung, his guru came back. And in the middle of the night, when he found, asked, where is that disciple of mine? He asked the people. They said, he's locked up in jail. Oh! Why? What did he do? He's a good fellow. And so he found himself at the jail. He spoke to the disciple. Guruji, I'm sorry. I will never, 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 never eat anything again. I will fast on water. Whatever you say, please save me. <laughs> Nobody can fast only on water. Don't worry. But now we will leave this city. You cannot stay here anymore. This is a city of fools. And anybody here can never prosper. Yes, Guruji, I will never disobey you or argue with you again. So the Guru sought an audience with the king. He went to the king and said, O oh, wisest of king, O oh, wonderful monarch, your majesty, please tell me, who is bigger, the disciple or the guru? The king said, the guru, without a doubt, it has to be. We cannot make it anything else. Ah, well then, your majesty, you must hang me and not my disciple. Hang you? Why? And the disciple then began to clamor because he had been brought there too. No, no, no. Me, hang me first. Me first. And the two began to quarrel. The king and the minister looked at each other. There was something fishy. Oh, holy man, you must tell me why you are saying this. Why did you wish to be hanged? I need a fat man for the noose. Why? What's wrong with you? I cannot tell you. It's a secret. There are no secrets from the king. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't mean it like that, your majesty. That's not what I meant at all. Um, I'm just saying that it is a very powerful thing and I cannot tell anybody otherwise. Okay, Your Majesty, if you if you are insisting so much and because you are so wise and wonderful, I will tell you. But you must promise. You must promise, Your Majesty, to hang me first. All right, I will. And so he came there and whispered in the king's ear, Your Majesty, you have done a very magical thing unknowingly. What you have done? You have made night into day and day into night. You have done tapasya by staying awake so many nights. Not you, but so many people. Your entire kingdom stays awake at night. So much tapasya has gone. In that way, because of this great tapasya, what has happened is the God of death, Yam Dev, the God of death and justice is very pleased. And then you erected a new scaffold, ornamented. And then a new noose. It has become sacred. You know that the fanda or the noose is the weapon of Lord Yam or the God of Justice. So what will happen now is the man, he has decided that whoever will be hanged on this wonderful justice scaffold, will be reborn as the king of this country in his next life. And in addition, he will enjoy heaven before he comes to be reborn. And the second person to go will become the minister. Then after that, if there are any more innocent people, they will also become people of power. But any criminals, then the power of that scaffold will go away. 
Oh, is that so? All right. Guards, bind this guru and this disciple. Do not let them come here. The guru allowed himself to be tied up. And the king called his minister. They began to discuss quietly what was happening. And they both decided that they did not want to let go of the kingdom. And they would do anything to be the king and the minister in their next life. And so the king said, Guards, you must listen. I wish to test the news. And the minister will do it after me. The people were confused, but they were so used to obeying orders, they did not question. And the king climbed up on that scaffold and asked the people, Cheer! Bajao! Nagare bajao! And the drums beat. It was as if he was being coronated again. And the music played, the flower petals came on him as he stood there and then was hung. The minister came quickly and ordered the noose man. Me next, quickly, before anyone else. And the noose man in all the confusion and all the noise did it again. The moment they realized, the people saw, oh my goodness, the king and his minister are gone. Ah, oh. and there was chaos. They didn't know what to do. And they debated long and long into the night, wondering what would happen when they remembered the guru and his disciple. And they unbound them and fell at their feet and begged them, please, Guruji, you have saved us. Will you please rule our kingdom for us? The guru was not really ready, but the disciple was ready at once. After much pleading, the guru decided that he would rule the kingdom until such time a wise and benevolent king could be found. And so he did. He ruled the kingdom and no longer was this country Andhir Nagri, Chopat Raja, Takisare Bhaji, Takisare Khaja. Thank you. <laughs> Truly a fool's paradise. Yes. Wonderful story, Preeti. Uh, lovely. If you just want to uh, share something uh, uh, briefly with the viewers, we have come to the end of the session and I would like us to sit back, reflect, absorb the story and uh, take it in. Yes. So uh, this was a story that I, I pestered my mother to tell me when I was a very small, a very little girl because she would use this proverb. And I would not know what it meant. So I didn't know what it meant because I didn't know what a taka was. I didn't know what a seer was. And obviously, Andher Nagri means I knew there was a place in Mumbai called Andheri, but I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> so it was it was one of those things. I lived in Mumbai in Bandra when I was growing up. So so it was a it was an interesting thing for me to know that you know there was such a story and there was a proverb. And when I became a storyteller, this became a very interesting uh, story to tell my clients when when we were planning with very egoistic, um, you know, CEOs and heads of companies because I wanted to teach them or give them this information that you have to plan because we're all going to go at some stage. So I use the story once for succession planning and once to, you know, to discover, to, to show how you need to have wise people to, to advise you. It doesn't matter if it's a company or a country or a house. Uh, a king and its minister cannot be foolish. <laughs> so that's Absolutely. where it comes from. Absolutely. And it comes from a play written by uh, uh, Bhartendu Harish Chandra. And it's it's a very old play. It's been made into a lot of movies, plays, and it, it has. I, when I st when I found out it, I thought it was a folk tale initially, and then I went deeper into the research, and I found out it was initially started off as a play, and now it has become part of our Indian culture. <laughs> so, absolutely. I mean, uh, 
what a wonderful story muhavaris or your uh, uh, how would you translate muhavaris into english i guess proverbs. it is proverbs yes i remember you know you have to reference to the context and then uh, what better way than a story thank you preeti that was indeed awesome what a lovely session of two stories pregnant with so much underlying wisdom meaning and the first story all about inclusion beautiful and the second one also you know no fool like a fool and uh, <laughs> try and be a wise fool yeah <laughs> so thank you storytellers cafe is very happy to have hosted you and we wish you all the best and stay safe stay sane in singapore in the small island and hope this pandemic will pass over soon uh, so that we can all meet each other in real life and not on virtual medium yes thank you for having me here i appreciate uh, all of this and i'm trusting that our listeners and viewers will have a wonderful time as well thank you yes thank you preeti namaskar sat sri akal welcome and adab You are listening to Bharat FM, a one of its kind multilingual eclectic provider of entertainment, information and news to Indian Americans. Headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio, Bharat FM airs shows out of Cincinnati, Chicago and Phoenix. We take pleasure in our ability to cater to your bhakti, chusti, sphurti, shakti and masti needs with our audio and visual shows. Check out bharatfm.com for our online program schedule and archives. I'm sure the content will definitely tickle your senses. Tune in via the 24-hour web streaming on bharatfm.com or via the Bharat FM app. More information can be procured at 513-488-5070. This is Bharat FM. Bajega Bharat, jhumega Bharat. Bharat FM. Ye hai Bharat FM. Bajega Bharat, jhumega Bharat.